Hey church, I hope you're doing well. Have you ever had to ask somebody for something? I, I hope you're saying, of course. I, I mean, we, we've all had to ask people from things for things from, from time to time. That's kind of not that great of a question to start this message off with. So maybe I should uh, try again. Well, let's, let's ask this question instead. How, how do you feel when you have to ask somebody for something. That might get you to think just a little bit more, right? That, that's a, a more subjective type question. How do you feel when you have to ask somebody for something? What, what does that make you feel like? For me, I, I feel a whole lot of different ways, depending on a, a couple of things. Uh, depending on a, a couple of factors, it, it makes me feel differently uh, about when I ask people for things. The two biggest things are what and who. What am I asking for and who am I asking it of? Uh, what, am, what am I looking to get and who is the person that I'm directing the question to? Depending on the answer to those things, I can feel anywhere from uh, kind of anxious and nervous to excited or uh, just sort of normal. I can have lots of energy and my heart can race uh, real quickly or I can just kind of be relaxed or whatever about it. The answers to what and who in terms of when I ask people for things make a big difference. Maybe that's the same for you. Let me just give you an example. Let's pretend just for a moment that I'm hungry. Okay, I don't, I don't have to pretend, but, but let's just say I'm hungry. That's, that's surprising, right? And let's say that I want a, a spicy chicken sandwich. Now, I'm not in a position where I can make myself a spicy chicken sandwich. I don't have a deep fryer. I don't have the knowledge on how to do that. I cannot do that whatsoever. I need to ask somebody else for help. So the answer to those questions, the what, I, I'm wanting a spicy chicken sandwich. That's what I'm looking to ask for. Now let's move on to the who. Who am I going to ask that of? If I happen to be at, you know, a spicy chicken sandwich type restaurant, say I, I stroll into Chick-fil-A, that, and I ask the person behind the counter for the, the spicy chicken sandwich, you know, that, the, if that's the who, I'm feeling pretty good about this question. It's not that hard for me to walk into Chick-fil-A, to go up to the counter, to ask the person behind the register and say, may I have a spicy chicken sandwich, please? I know they're going to ask me for cash. I understand how this works, but that's an easy ask. That's an easy scenario. That's an easy situation in which I can ask somebody for something and it doesn't make me feel all nervous or weird or funny inside. It's normal sort of day-to-day -day life. Well, not every day, but you know, when I'm craving a spicy chicken sandwich. Let's say, for instance, though, the who change. That changes how I might feel drastically. For instance, if I just happened to be, you know, at a worship conference, and I was walking outside and I saw Chris Tomlin going to his tour bus. If I still wanted the spicy chicken sandwich, but I directed that question towards Chris Tomlin, I would feel a lot differently. It would feel kind of weird to be like, hey Chris, may I please have a spicy chicken sandwich? It would make me nervous and you know, maybe embarrassed and, and all kind of other, other things because the who has changed. The same thing if you wanted to do like a different Tomlin and you were walking down the streets of Pittsburgh and, and Coach Mike Tomlin was walking by. I, I wouldn't be like, hey, Coach, can I have a spicy chicken sandwich? It, it would make me feel differently than asking the person behind the register at the Chick-fil-A. So if the who changes, I feel differently. My emotions change as well. But what about if the what changes? What if, what if I want something different. Well, let's say, for instance, I was after uh, an autograph. Let's, let's just imagine that I wanted to start this collection of autographs, people and their pictures and their signature on them. I don't want to do that, but let's, let's just pretend that that was happening. 
If I walked into the Chick-fil-A and I had a picture of the person uh, behind the counter and I said, man, I just really love your autograph. Can you sign this picture of you for me? I'd feel a little worried about that. How did I get the picture? Why do I want the autograph? All of that seems a little weird. And, and I would worry, you know, that they would think I'm making fun of them or, or doing some other kind of crazy stuff. Changing the what in that case makes a difference. Same thing w with Chris Tomlin. You know, if, if I went to Chris Tomlin and he was at a table and he was signing autographs and I came up with a picture and said, hey, Chris, I, I, I really appreciate your worship and your heart. We, do you mind signing this for me? I'd feel differently than I would have asking him for the, the spicy chicken sandwich or if I approached Coach Tomlin in the same way. Hey, Coach, do you mind signing this picture for me? And he was expecting it. He'd feel differently about that interaction. What you're asking for and who you're asking it to, to receive it from, it, it makes a difference in terms of how at least I feel and I imagine how you feel when we're asking for things. There is, you know, one other factor, a third little thing that, that makes a difference, at least in my mind, about this type of thing, and that is the timing of the question. Uh, the timing of the interaction. Say I do that chicken sandwich scenario again, I'm wanting that spicy chicken sandwich, uh, and uh, the person who order takes my order for the spicy chicken sandwich, let's just say that, that after Chick-fil-A closes, I, I follow them home, and, and they're in their driveway, and they're wanting you know to go about their life and, and to remove themselves from Chick-fil-A for a while, and I, I roll up in my car and I say, hey, can I have a spicy chicken sandwich? Eh, the timing's not so good. Perfectly fine question a little bit before, but at that moment, not so great. Likewise, if, if Mr. Chris Tomlin is, is there playing the guitar, singing, how great is our God, and everybody's worshiping, and I take out the board, hey, Chris, can I have a spicy chicken sandwich? Timing. Not so good. Same deal for, you know, Coach Tomlin. He's on the sidelines calling in a play. That's not the time to go up and say, hey, Coach, you signed this picture for me. Those factors make a difference in how we ask questions and how we feel about asking questions. I hope, you know, we're, we're kind of on the same page with that. But now the question comes, what on earth are we doing talking about this? Glad you asked. We're entering into Lent. This is the first Sunday uh, of Lent. And as we take our Lenten journey this year, we're going to spend it uh, by concentrating on prayer. It's going to be a season of prayer. And so each Sunday, we're, we're going to look at different passages in the Bible, different stories, different prayers in, in the Bible, and, and just spend some time praying as we prepare for Easter. And just in case you, you missed out, I, I actually prepared a little prayer guide and, and calendar that, that you can follow through during this season. It'll tie in the messages. It'll give you things to pray about on, on a daily basis. And if you want that, let me know. But, but we're spending this time in Lent, in, in prayer. And as we do that, it's important that we start by asking a question that we've learned from the disciples and we ask for something and that we know where to direct that and the timing of that question as well. Our passage of scripture today will we'll point that out and, and I invite you to, to join with me in Luke. We're looking at chapter 11, starting in verse one and we'll wrap up in verse four. This is what, what Luke says. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So this guy had witnessed Jesus praying. This disciple had witnessed Jesus praying, and he had a hunger inside of him. It wasn't so much a hunger necessarily right then for a spicy chicken sandwich, but it was something deeper, 
uh, a deeper need that he had. The what of his question, the, the object, the thing that he wanted to receive was this ability to pray. And so that's what he's asking for. He asks for uh, this ability to pray. He wants to be taught how to pray. Hey, Jesus, can you teach me how to pray? A little bit better than a spicy chicken sandwich in my estimation. So that's, that's the what. And then we also know the who. He, he's directing the question at, at Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, will, will you teach me how to pray? He doesn't look to, you know, a, a manual. He doesn't uh, look to another disciple. He doesn't look towards another teacher. But he asks Jesus directly, will you teach me how to pray? That was the who. And then the timing, the, the context of it, it. He does this after Jesus had finished praying. So you can picture this disciples witnessing Jesus, conversing with the Father, praying and spending time in prayer. And, and Jesus finishes up that time. And the disciple says, you know, I, I'd really like to learn that from you. What he was asking for uh, was important. Who he was asking it of uh, was the right person. And the, and the timing of the ask was made at a good time. And so all of this leads into this teaching of, of Jesus. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not in temptation, into temptation. This disciple asked Jesus, uh, to teach him how to pray. And Jesus does just that. And, and it's maybe not caught right at first, but, but this is like me going into the, the Chick-fil-A and say, may I please have a spicy chicken sandwich? And they're like, sure. Not only will you get a spicy chicken sandwich, but let me just give you the party platter. You can have a stack of spicy chicken sandwiches. We'll give another stack of the originals. Chicken nuggets are there. Mac and cheese on the side. You can have the whole shebang. Cookies for dessert. Ice cream cones, milkshakes, and gallons of lemonade. All for, for no cost. This disciple asked Jesus, teach me how to pray. And Jesus does just that. He, he gives him so much more than the disciple maybe even expect it. He says, Father. And, and that sounds kind of formal, you know, to our ears. But at the time, and in Jesus' words, it would have been Abba, more of like a, a daddy, you know? This was a, a close, intimate, personal kind of uh, way to, to reference God. And, and so Jesus says, start off this way, Father. Abba, Daddy. There's this picture of, you know, a, a young person pulling on their daddy's uh, coat and saying, Daddy, my tummy, my tummy's rumbly. I, I'm hungry. I need a spicy chicken sandwich. And they have no way to get it. No way to, to cook it. No way to buy it. No way to, to acquire it whatsoever. Completely dependent on the, the parent on the dead. And Jesus wants us to come before God in this way, recognizing that we're completely dependent upon God to answer our, our needs, to provide what we need. We come to, to God first off by, by saying, Abba, Father, we need you. We trust you. We, we love you. We need your help, your hand, your provision. And that's where Jesus starts father and then he continues hallowed be your name this isn't just you know some some pushover dad he he's clear at the beginning that that this father is is also righteous and holy hallowed hallowed means to be holy to be set apart and he says hallowed be your name and if we remember with our bible readings and studies that names 
are important within scripture, that they often mean more than just a, na a name. And so hallowed be your name means that that's God's character. That's God's nature. That God is holy and set apart and righteous and worthy of worship and honor and praise. And so this Abba, this Father who, who we're in intimate and close relationship with is also worthy of our worship and our praise and our adoration. He's also holy and set apart. That is his character and his nature. And as we pray, there's this recognition of that, that both of those things are true, that God is personal and real and, and loving and, and a righteous father, but also that God is holy, blameless, other, set apart. Jesus continues, your kingdom come. And, and we know from, you know, praying versions of this prayer or, or from Matthew, your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's uh, more to it there, but, but your kingdom come. Your will, your plan, your rule, your way. As we make this request, as we pray to you, as we ask the ask but ultimately we're wanting your kingdom god to come in our lives and if our intention is a little bit off uh, that comes first that your kingdom would come to us here on earth as it is in heaven and then jesus says give us each day our daily bread provide for those needs we're hungry, Lord, and we, we need, you know, a spicy chicken sandwich. Or, or we're, we're afraid, Lord, and we need these things. Jesus gives us an example of, of asking for, for everyday life, for things that are common and ordinary, for talking to God about anything that weighs on our heart and on our mind or passes through our brain. We're, we're able in this context, in this relationship, to talk to God, to God about any of that. God, you're, you're our heavenly Father. You're holy and righteous. We want your will, your kingdom to be done in our life. And, and we trust you even, Lord, to provide for the little stuff, the things that we think are insignificant for our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Now, this isn't, you know, God, you have to forgive because we can. But it, it's more like if, if even we can forgive, imagine how much more God can, who is perfect love. So, so forgive us, Lord, in your love and your mercy and your grace, and, and help us also to forgive others, for that's what you've, you've done for us. And all of this is incorporated into this prayer. And, and then he ends here. And Luke with, uh, and lead us not into temptation. Keep us in your kingdom. Keep us in your light. We don't want to play that game where we're seeing how close to sin we can get before we actually sin. If I just hang over the edge, does that count? If I dip my toe in the water, does that count? If I just do a little taste of it, does that count? No. Don't lead us to a place where we'll be tempted to do things that are contrary to your will, to who you are, to the, the reverence and the holiness of your character and your grace and your mercy and your love. And don't lead us into places that we would create trouble for ourselves. Keep us from that. Keep us on your path. And Jesus, just by putting together this little bit has so much. It's a deep, deep well of prayer. And I'm sure we haven't gone and worked our way even to the bottom of it. That there's more that we could learn from, from Christ here. That the Spirit would, would reveal even more to us and how we might pray. It's an amazing thing. A disciple went to Jesus and, and knew what to ask. He asked how might I pray? He knew who to ask it of. He asked it of Jesus. And he had good timing, for it was recorded and it continues to teach us all. 
And that's the thing that I want for us to learn today. I want for, for us to learn from Jesus and his example, absolutely. I also want us to learn from this disciple that we might have that same attitude. That no matter if we've been praying for, for years and years and decades upon decades, that there's still this attitude of humility that we can go before the Lord and say, God, would you teach me to pray? Would you teach me how to talk to you? I don't have it all figured out. And yes, guidebooks and watching others and studying and all of that stuff can be important and beneficial, but we want to go right to you, Jesus, and ask you, continue to teach me to pray. The what is, is we learn how to pray. The who is the we ask Jesus. And the timing, at this point, there is no bad time. The timing is now. Jesus is, is willing and ready and able to guide us into a deeper prayer life, a deeper conversation through him with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so my hope as we start our Lenten journey is that this would be our prayer, that we would pray the Lord's Prayer, that we would experience God through it, that we would learn from that, and also that we would ask, that we would ask Jesus, to teach us how to pray and that we might be drawn into a deeper relationship with God because of that. Friend, would you do that today? Would you just spend some time here and now? And shut your eyes, get on your knees, whatever it is that, that you need to do. But would you spend some time now and ask God that? Ask Jesus that. Lord, can you teach me to pray? I need some help in that area. And I trust that you will show me. For God's sake, for his glory. Amen.